All righty then. Well, thank you. We do appreciate you taking that poll this morning. And we love that we have parents and we have professionals. So we always appreciate our professionals that work with our military connected children, but do understand that um, the parent support webinars have actually been designed with the parents as a target audience as target audience. So before we introduce ourselves, I want to share a little bit more about MSEC and its mission. The Military Child Education Coalition is a nonprofit organization that was established 25 years ago, and our mission is to support all military-connected children by educating, advocating, and collaborating to resolve educational challenges that are associated with our military lifestyle. In 2005, MSEC formalized support and programming for military-connected parents, you all parents, so that they, you, may be empowered, informed, and proactive in supporting your children's educational journey. We strive to deliver informative and interactive webinars, such as this one, that address academic, social, and emotional issues associated with a military family lifestyle. Our vision, MSEC vision, is that every military child is college, work, and life ready. Let me tell you just a little bit about myself. Uh, Michelle Brashear. I am again in Alabama. I'm in Madison, Alabama, which is just outside Huntsville, the Rocket City, Northern Alabama. So my husband uh, and I together, he was military. I was the spouse, uh, did almost 30 years active duty. Uh, we have two military connected children that are now adults. Um, and gosh, we moved 14 plus times and yeah, we've been there, done it all. So I appreciate that I have been able to help uh, work with MSEC and helping parents and professionals since 2017. Emily? Great. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Barton. I have been with MSEC since 2018 as a parent educator, a member of the webinar team, and I'm thrilled to be with you all today. I live in Montgomery, Alabama, and it is a little chilly here today, but uh, but again, no snow, so that's that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, we, my husband and I have been married for 24 years. He has been in the Air Force. He's active duty. He has been in for that many years. We have two children. We have a 20-year-old who is a college student out in Texas, and we have a senior in high school. He is 17. And uh, I know that I get a lot of information, very helpful information from this webinar, and I hope that you all will too. All right, so we have just a few administrative announcements before we continue. At the end of today's webinar, we would appreciate if you wouldn't mind taking the survey about today's webinar. It, this is a key method that we use to tell our funders how we're doing and where we need to make adjustments so that we can continue offering you all the very best training opportunities possible. You will see a chat box on your screen. Feel free to ask questions during the webinar. Uh, you will also see that we have put the downloadable resource which accompanies today's topic. And so please feel free to download that. If you are joining us by phone, you won't be able to download the resource, but if you'll just put a private message to us in the chat box, we will make sure that uh, you receive it today. So just put your email address in there and we'll send it out to you today. This webinar is being recorded. You can always view the recording later if you want to review the material or if you experience any technical difficulties during the presentation. We're going to go ahead and jump into our topic. So here are the learning objectives for today. By the end of the webinar, parents and caregivers will be able to identify some of the main changes that occur during adolescence, recognize the importance of independency during these teenage years, understanding the roles during the independency gaining process, and develop strategies to help your teens acquire independency skills. Adolescence is a transitional phase of growth and development between childhood and adulthood. It is not uncommon for parents or guardians to feel at a loss for how to handle their teenagers during this transitional period of development. 
During adolescence, our children are developing significantly during a very short period of time, comparable only to those infancy years. They gain 50% of their adult body weight and they experience a tremendous amount of internal and external body changes and become capable of reproducing. During these years, our adolescents start assuming adult responsibilities, such as finding a job, figuring out romantic relationships, and how to be good friends. During this time, the human brain transforms enormously. It continuously develops throughout the period of adolescence and doesn't fully mature into an adult brain until the mid-20s. Different parts of the brain grow at different rates. The rapid development of the brain's emotion center relates to where mo much of the, the passion and sensitivity and enth enthusiasm for new experiences occurs. The decision-making center of the brain fully develops during adolescence. And during this time, the brain is highly flexible, which means that teens are constantly taking in new information and forming ideas, opinions, and connections. So if you have an adolescent like me, you may have noticed that your child is being very sensitive or emotional, and this is, this is quite common. An awareness of our teens' physical and emotional changes can help us as parents and caregivers set realistic expectations of our children's behaviors and reactions as we're helping them become more independent. So we're going to watch a video now. In this video, Dr. Anisha Abraham is going to answer the questions of why our teens do have these heightened emotions. Teen brain development is a fascinating part of the development during adolescence. And I think it's important for parents to know that the brain is a work in progress during the teen years. And in fact, the brain is not fully developed until about 25 years of age. Um, certainly, young people also may have a heightened kind of emotional response to things that are happening during the adolescence. One of the things that we know, an important concept, is that the limbic system, which has to do with pleasure and reward, is a little bit stronger during the teen years than something else called the prefrontal cortex, which has to do with logic and rational thought and self-awareness. And that partly is the reason why teenagers may experience things in a heightened way, because the limbic system, which has to do with emotions and pleasure and reward, is much stronger. And I think parents probably still remember the music they listened to when they were a teenager, and maybe remember their first crushes or attractions, because all of those experiences and feelings are much stronger during the teen years. Um, the other thing that we know is that the frontal lobe is very much developed during the adolescence period, and connections are being fully made to the brain during that time. And we know that that area is very much part of executive functioning and decision making. And it isn't until later that in adolescence that all of these connections are fully made. So for all of these reasons, we know that teen brain development is really important in terms of emotional decision making in adolescence. And that certainly protecting the teen brain and getting young people to sleep well, to eat well, to not use alcohol and drugs, which all affect the teen brain, is a very important part of what we can do as parents to guide them. Okay, so you can see that our role as parents is very important during this time. I think the information that I gleaned from that video every time I see it is um, about the executive functioning and that this brain is still developing during this time. And it's our role as parents to help them take care of their bodies, help them make, get them the right food, try to help them get the right amount of sleep, and then to guide them and hopefully away from all those risky behaviors. And we'll talk a little bit more about the role of parents. And I thought it was funny that I know my favorite music is from when I was, you know, I think middle school, high school. So that's very, very interesting. I always like that. So one of a parent's goals is to raise young people, of course, to be those thriving adults. And the role of a teenager's parent is not the same as that of a young child. So when children are young, uh, we as parents manage every aspect of their lives from bedtime to meals and activities and made nearly every decision for them. But when there are 
when our teenagers you know get older our role of parents have to change our teenagers reach that milestone of um, independence so we have to remember that teenagers don't think like young adults or young kids they think like teenagers so our parental strategies need to evolve and develop according to each stage or development. And we as parents have to try to empathize with our teenagers and understand, you know, now these and now adolescents, how they see the world and how they view their independence. What does that you know, mean to them? It's important to understand that the parent's role may change throughout our kids' lives, but the importance of it never does. So let's look, how does independency look for our teens? Independence for a teen means establishing their own identity and becoming that separate individual. So let's look at the decision-making process. Teens want to be involved in the decision-making at this point, right? Particularly in the areas that are related to them, right? So what, what they're wearing, um, their haircut, their hairstyle. Remember parents, that's a temporary thing. <laughs> when to do their homework. Um, how to arrange the room, which is a really good thing, especially when moving, because it does help give them control, a sense of control, and uh, what to do with their allowance. You know, if you're a family that has that allowance, right, are they allowed to keep it and do what they want? And then as a family member, teens often want to have more to say about what goes on in the family. For example, our military connected teens may like to share their opinions regarding the new duty station. I think we as Spouses do too, but it doesn't always work in our way. But we wanted we wanted them to be able to have their input, and they also want to voice in what they eat often, um, maybe where the family goes on vacation, and what movies they watch when they sit down together. It gets harder as they get older because everybody has those different opinions on movies. Uh, teens may also want to provide input when creating those rules and setting those boundaries at home, particularly again the ones that apply to them, and. Uh, we have just a, a little engagement question. Can you think of any family rules that your teen would like to change? Something that you have set up at home um, that your family would say, yeah, that my teen would really like to change that one. Emily and I, Emily, you had a good one. Yes, I know that um, my son would like for me to change the rule that food and drink are allowed in the bedrooms we we do not I do not allow it because all of the dishes and glasses and cups and utensils end up in his room and so I have initiated the rule that no food is in the bedroom but he would like for that to change and I've told Emily that I did not make that rule um and gosh I wish I would have because it is true we we lose like where are all my spoons and I could usually find them <laughs> Uh, all right, well, let's look at the next, let's look at teen opinions and values, right? Our, our kids are becoming independent. They're developing their own opinions and their own values. And they may become a little argumentative as they you know, strive to assert their own beliefs and their own views. And sometimes teens switch from their parents' opinions to following their friends or maybe their friends' families. So that can be very difficult for us as parents as we think we've done a great job <laughs> and they turn on us, but it's just really part of that growing and independency that they're learning. They may come around. <laughs> and then that autonomy, teens start becoming independent partly because their parents spend less time with them. Uh, the consistent family separations like military families experience can even help military connected teens to become more independent faster than their civilian peers. Some parents know, you know, just they just know less about their teens activities and their friends and their preferences. They're just not around them as much. Teens are taking on all those new responsibilities like driving, maybe having a part-time job, or participating in extracurricular activities outside of the home. We're not dropping them off anymore and spending that time in the car with them. Um, some teens, again, they'll push boundaries. They'll argue for the sake of arguing and compete with you for the ongoing battle for power. It's not comfortable, but it's not a surprise. It's part of that independency. Yeah, and my teens take opposite opinions. Yeah, I think they're just, you know, trying to see what, what you'll do, what they'll say, what you'll say. And they're just looking at, they're opening their eyes to the world and trying to think about different things. But for finding that balance, 
between giving them too much freedom and becoming overprotective is one of the biggest obstacles that we have to overcome as parents. However, it's a healthy, natural part of how a teen grows to be that independent adult. How do we give them independence and power without, yeah, it's a, a difficult balance. And that's, you know, that's part of what we're doing today is trying to help you find where that fits right for you. And hopefully when you leave today, you do have a better sense of, you know, what, what your role is. Emily? Absolutely. We are going to talk some about that today because it it is tricky for all of us as parents. Uh, so independence is a learned skill. Though some teens do develop it quicker than others, no one just naturally knows how to be independent. Just like learning to walk or drive that car, we want to teach our children the steps to becoming confident, capable adults. When parents do foster independency skills, our teens will depend less on their parents. They'll take on more responsibility. They will be able to make thoughtful decisions and solve problems. They begin to work out their life values and form their own identity. In the process, there may be some challenges. Parents and teens may disagree on how long this process should take to achieve these objectives, and teens may see themselves ready before their parents do, or possibly vice versa. So let's think a little bit about how we as parents can begin to foster this independence in our teens. So to begin fostering independence, we're going to talk about three main strategies. The first is setting rules and boundaries. The second deals with responsibilities and how to give teens adequate responsibilities. And these responsibilities are opportunities to teach different life skills and social emotional skills, including things like time management and organization, managing money, social and emotional skills, and decision making. And then the third strategy has to do with balanced parenting and that parent-teen relationship, as well as using failure as a learning tool. So first, we're going to start with, with that first one of establishing rules. Research has shown that children thrive from routine and stability. The creation of boundaries and the comfort that our youth find in them does not change when our children become teenagers. Setting up these age-appropriate rules are crucial. So here are a few things to consider before setting up rules. Conflict can occur when our teens feel that the rules are a way to control them and interfere with growing their independence. Also keep in mind that every child is different Therefore, rules and expectations should reflect their maturity and not necessarily their age. We also really encourage you to, to establish collaboration with your teen when creating rules. This gives your teens a chance to be heard when these rules are created. And when our teens have input on expectations and consequences, they are much more likely to support them. Boundaries and rules can be flexible. Limits may be different for different situations and should evolve as your teen grows older. If limits are too strict, the child might not have enough room to grow and try new experiences. And just know that this period of establishing rules is a learning curve for both parents and children. And uh, we as parents must be prepared for some trial and error. It's not gonna be perfect the first time when, when you start out setting rules. Uh, so uh, Dr. Judith Smetana is a professor of psychology whose research examines adolescent parent relationships. Her research suggests that when establishing boundaries, consider having the rules fall into the following categories. And so the first category is safety. I do have a question for all of you. If you have moved to a new duty station, 
Uh, what do you think would be your teen's first reaction if you say, I don't want you to go with go out with your friends alone? I know that when I have said that, my children have not been happy about that. But it is a matter of their safety and their uh, familiarity with new friends and the new environment. It really is a safety factor. So we know that our teens are more likely to accept a rule if they understand that it keeps them safe. As an adult, you understand that it may not be safe to go to places that you're not familiar with or be around people that you're not familiar with. We may think that this is obvious to our teens, but without an explanation about the safety element, our teens may think that it is an, a personal attack on them or their friends. So we want to be very uh, clear with them that it is a safety issue. So the second uh, rules category concerns values. Children need a fundamental sense of right and wrong to make sure that, that they are prepared to make wise choices, contribute to the world, and become stable adults. Here are a few considerations for parents. Teens do see their parents as the source of their values. Consider framing or establishing rules around your family's values and know that every family's beliefs are, are different. Uh, the, these types of rules that are built around values will help your teens develop character virtues that you value. So it's an important consideration uh, to make when setting rules. So the third category of rules is how to act in society. We as parents are our children's first teachers, especially regarding social situations. Parents teach our teens how to behave in public and interact appropriately with their peers. So a few things that we as parents must consider when establishing these types of rules. Take the time to explain why the rule is in place. Make it clear that the rules are in place to prepare them to be successful in the future. When establishing rules about how your teens interact in society, you may include giving them some ownership of their personal territory. So for example, and Michelle talked about this uh, a couple of minutes ago, give them some ownership over what they wear, the music they listen to, their hairstyle and relationships. So you might want to consider allowing them some ownership over those things. When parents and teens do disagree, open communication is needed, and these rules need to be established based on caring and not controlling. So I, I have another question for you all. So using those three categories that we just talked about, the, the safety, the values, and how to act in society, I'd love for you to share an example of a rule that you have in your family that could fall under one of those categories. And as you're thinking about that, I will share uh, one rule that we have in our family uh, surrounds that, that app on your phone, Life360. We do require our teenager who's driving to have that app on all the time. And it's, it is a safety issue. I, I would consider it falling under that safety category. And uh, we'll go ahead and move on, but just be thinking about those rules and, and maybe rules that you already have established in your family or rules that you'd like to set. Yeah, Carlos was saying about when they moved uh, overseas and I was tr tried to type it not that well, but when we moved to Germany, we had the same. Our kids were in middle school. They just wanted to be able to go. And it's so hard when you don't know anybody yet. So until I try to explain to them, until I know their friends and their friends' families, um, I don't feel comfortable. So a lot of times I want to have the kids come to our house first. So that requires them to be a little bit more open. But I think doing things in groups in the beginning makes it a lot easier for everybody. So I don't know if that helps anybody, but I think that did definitely helped our kids. 
So let me ask a, a question that is kind of just a fun question. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. Does anybody know what movie that came from? Superhero movie. With great power comes great response. Yes, we have a winner. <laughs> it's I think it's the original Spider Man. Uncle Ben, you know, said that to young Peter Peter Parker. So obviously, this is where our kids are, uh, and, and when they're teenagers, the teenagers are when children start gaining those privileges that come with more responsibility. Some parents are not sure if their teens are quite ready for more responsibility and more privileges. And some parents are actually afraid of giving their teens too much freedom before they're ready. Sometimes this is denying of those teens both the responsibilities they require to develop maturity and the opportunities that they need to make choices and accept their consequences. So again, it's that balancing act um, as a parent. So what are some of the indicators that children can move towards gaining more responsibility? Think about it. How often does your teen think about those consequences of the decisions or the behaviors that they're engaging in or making? Uh, we always encourage you know, conversations with your kids. And when it comes to decision-making, it's really important to keep those lines of communication open, especially uh, decisions regarding maybe their safety or their future, their education. Um, they could always put the blame on me. Yeah, that's a good thing. I've heard a lot of people have kind of code things on their phones where they can send it to their parents to, you know, come and get me, get me out of this situation. Can you, can your teen identify maybe pros and cons of different options? Or are they kind of like, no, I know this is what I need. And, you know, once one thought, um, how impulsive is your child? Can they think before acting? Do they have reasonable impulse control? Remember, their executive skills are still growing, like learning. So learning to be responsible and having that freedom is all part of becoming capable adults. Parents must provide opportunities for their teens to show them that they can be responsible. And these opportunities can be found at school, at, at home, maybe at work, um, and with friends. Uh, Age-appropriate responsibilities are also a great way for our kids to learn earn more privileges and develop those life skills that they can become more confident and again, independent. Yeah, it, the rules are hard, <laughs> but again, if they're involved in the rulemaking, it does help. And I think, live, yeah, living on base is a little bit more of a safety factor. I would agree. When we lived in Germany, we lived off base, but it was open. So it was a little bit different of a situation. So we're gonna watch another video on helping teens achieve their potential. Well, I think that parents can help teens live up to their potential by um, setting high expectations is one. So oftentimes I think we tend to underestimate adolescence. Um, it is a time when they're undergoing a lot of wonderful change um, and they're really attuned to kind of social relationships and social information. Um, but we need to understand that they are sort of particularly you know, wired for that kind of change so that they're really sort of set up um, to meet the needs of adolescents. Adolescence is a time when young people need opportunities to practice the adult roles that they're preparing for, um, to gain experience in social relationships, um, to engage in kind of complex decision-making that may have important implications for their future. So supporting opportunities um, for those kinds of skill, skills to develop in teens is something that parents really need to encourage. It's also important that parents understand that adolescents are likely to make mistakes. The ways in which they make decisions during adolescence when oftentimes social, you know, the immediate social context may um, be more important or more salient than, you know, sort of the long distant future can make it look like they're not making the kinds of decisions that adults might agree with. 
Um, but I think it's important to understand that adolescents may make decisions um, that are not ideal um, and that they'll have an opportunity to learn from them. So opportunities to make mistakes and seeing those mistakes as learning opportunities, I think is really critical. So that one mistake doesn't necessarily mean that an adolescent faces lifelong penalties. And mistakes, again, are really opportunities for growth. So because it's a period of tremendous growth, then um, having a chance to make mistakes um, is important and having an opportunity to practice some of the kinds of skills that adolescents will need in adulthood um, is really important. So we talk about the life skills, right? So life, life skills, life allows for many opportunities for our teens to learn those responsibilities. So depending upon your individual circumstances, your military connected teen may already have had to take on additional responsibilities, such as when maybe a service member is, you know, TY or, um, or deployed, or in cases where maybe they have to take on additional caregiving responsibilities, like when we have a wounded service member. So here are some of more opportunities for practical ideas of life skills that parents can initiate with their kids. Let's look at it at home first. Wanna teach them to cook. Learn knowing how to prepare or cook food is one of the primary life skills for teenagers. They tend to like to eat, so it is nice if they can make their own stuff occasionally. <laughs> Consider teaching them basic food skills so that they can live independently after leaving home. Um, have them help you with planning meals and buying the groceries for you. Maybe send them out with a list. Teach them how to use and maintain those kitchen appliances like a coffee maker or um, toaster. You got to clean it out every now and then, right? Dishwasher, the oven. This may sound obvious, but often teens only know how to use the microwave and many don't know how to properly clean them either. I can vouch for that one. <laughs> uh, so I know that um, that's something that we did during COVID when both of our kids were home from college. Uh, they took turns once a week making dinner for us. So because we were having to cook every day, you know, then. But it was really interesting to see what they chose. And sometimes they worked together and sometimes they didn't. Um, but you also want to include teams in the basic maintenance of the house. So teach them to vacuum, to dust, right? To clean those bathrooms. Teach them to wash clothes by hand or, you know, a washing machine and how to deal with simple stains, how to read the labels, know what fabrics go together, what colors, teach them to do simple repairs around the house. Maybe just change those air filters in your in your HVAC system. Uh, when bringing in a professional for repairs, maybe the parents can have the team, you know, watch, watch the process of, of how it is to hire someone for this kind of a job. And military families, you know, we all move frequently. We talked about living in military housing overseas. So maybe teach them how to call maintenance and how to supervise the repairs if they realize something's wrong and you're not able to do it. Another thing is looking at time management and organization. The lack of organization is one factor that leads to poor time management. So sometimes our military connected teams have to move to a different school in the middle of the school year, which can be very stressful. I mean, it can be stressful in the summertime too, but in the middle of the school year, a lot worse, right? So teaching them that good time management and organizational skills can help them during this type of transition. Some of the things that parents and caregivers can do to help teach time management and organization is to help teens identify important and urgent tasks and how to set priorities in what they need to do. Um, teach them how to organize their time using just a planner or a, a lot of people, a lot of kids now use their phone, you know, as to organize their time. Uh, let them create their own schedule, though. So it's a lot easier if they create their own schedule. Let them decide when they need to get up in the morning and figure out how much time they need for chores and for other activities. And then parents that we also want to model good time management behavior because they're always watching us. Um, there are some wonderful complete webinars on time management, 
and organization that MSEC has. And Emily has put those links in the chat box, the recordings, so you can go watch them at any time. One time management for your middle and high school students, one understanding and helping your unorganized child. And they are on uh, our youth, the MSEC YouTube channel. So we encourage you to check it out. There's a lot more, but those two specific are related to what we're talking about today. Um, then we're talking about managing money. Financial discipline is a very important skill for our teenagers to learn. Children need to know when and how to spend and how to save. And understanding those basic financial concepts is essential to becoming a self-sufficient adult. Um, do your kids have a savings account, a checking account? Do they have a debit card and a credit card? Maybe they have investments already. Um, it's very important, I would tell you, our kids have debit cards and checking accounts and savings accounts, but obviously their debit card goes to their checking account. It, they really didn't understand why they needed to keep a register because the bank kept track of all of that, mom. <laughs> and honestly, it's probably not that mistakes don't happen as much as they did at one time, but it is important that they keep track and compare that to the bank because mistakes can happen. And it lets them know, of course, what their balance is. So there are many things that parents and caregivers can do to help their teens with that money management. Teach them how to make a budget and help them to create their own. Budgeting skills help them learn that value of money. They make them conscious of their spending and future planning. Again, parents, modeling is great. So show them how you budget. Um, show them how to open that bank account. Use an ATM card and keep track of their spending. <laughs> Teach them how not to get into debt using a credit card. Keep those low credit limits. Maybe paying off monthly should be their goal at this stage if they have one. And you want them to build their credit. So teaching them how credit works is crucial. Explain to them how quickly a person can get sucked into a whirlpool of debt if they're not careful. This is especially important when they go to college. They get all those credit cards thrown at them. <laughs> About it, Emily, we both have college kids. Um, it can be really um, easy for them to get lured in. Emily? Absolutely. I know my, my daughter receives credit card offers all the time. <laughs> constantly so yes but it's an important skill it's important for them to build their credit but to know how to use it wisely we are now going to move on and talk a little bit about those social and emotional skills during the teen years our teens need certain abilities to achieve their fullest potential at school at work and in their private social life these abilities help them recognize and manage their emotions, cope with obstacles and life challenges, as well as enhance communication skills and interpersonal relations, including empathy. All of these skills can be learned, but our teens need a chance to practice them under the guidance of experienced adults. So we'll talk first about listening. Hearing what people are saying is a valuable communication skill, which significantly impacts the quality of our relationships with other people. So as parents, we can teach our teens that uh, active listening is important and it allows us to not only hear the words that people are saying, but also the emotions that the words are reflecting. We want to teach our adolescents how to rephrase what the other person is saying and also help them understand that often they will hear differing points of view and they may disagree, but that is okay. We also want to help them uh, with develop their nonverbal communication skills. This nonverbal communication is one of the most critical aspects of dealing with people. The ability to understand and display proper nonverbal signs during communication or any other interaction between people helps uh, give everyone cues and information about the actual message being communicated. So there are ways that our teens can practice improving their nonverbal communication skills. Uh, we can help them practice establishing eye contact with the person that they're speaking with, facing a person when they're speaking, smiling at other people, sitting up straight, 
and concentrating on their tone of voice. So these are all important things that our teens need to practice and develop. And as military families, we do move frequently. And so it's important for us to show and again, practice with our teens how to introduce themselves when they meet new people or enter a new situation. It's also important uh, for our teens to practice assertiveness and self-advocacy. These are critical skills. Assure teens that it is okay to claim their rights or to ask questions or initiate and express their opinions and feelings. Let them know that it's okay to say no to other people in a, in a respectful way. So to practice these types of skills, consider having your teen do some of the following. Um, have them practice giving an honest compliment to someone. That's, that's important for us all to do. Or perhaps they could learn new things about somebody from their class. This is especially helpful after just moving to a new school or joining a, a new club or activity. They could uh, learn how to initiate that conversation and learn from someone else. Also have them practice uh, perhaps sharing with a friend what's been on their mind lately and opening up to a friend. It's also very important for them to learn how to call and schedule those doctor's appointments. Uh, Michelle and I both have college students and once they move off to college, they've got to learn how to do those things. And so it's important, I think, during adolescence that they know how to take that initiative and be assertive enough to make those phone calls. They also might want to, during middle and high school, learn how to ask a teacher or a coach for clarification of a, a task or an assignment that wasn't completely understood. That's a great way to develop that assertiveness. And then also emotional self-awareness. The self-awareness is the ability to understand our own inner processes and to relate adequately with other people. So emotional awareness in this context is the ability to recognize our feelings, and it is the foundation of emotional intelligence. In order to develop self-awareness with your teens, you can help them recognize and understand their feelings and how to handle them, and also recognize the feelings of others. This really helps them connect with other people and develop that empathy. During adolescence, relationships become a big part of our children's lives. Helping them develop healthy and valuable relationships can impact their development. So consider helping your teen develop these healthy relationships and value people, maintain healthy family relationships, that's very important, respecting people and, and their points of view is, is very important as well. Teaching your children behaviors and manners that they would display in a social setting is essential for them to have a smooth social life. The character of an ind individual is shown in the way that they behave. So it's important that, that they understand this. So consider the following to promote good social behavior. Help them learn etiquette, even party etiquette, uh, including how to be a host or how to be a good guest. Uh, teach them how to choose the right kind of clothes for specific occasions. That's very important. And gently tell your teen what their clothes say about them and the level of respect that they would get in certain situations, such as interviews. It's very important that they sort of understand that. And we can do that as parents in a very gentle way. Also, learning about moral behavior, honesty, and character. 
our teens must learn how to accept their mistakes and take responsibility for their actions. We know that they are going to make mistakes, uh, but we want them to be able to accept them and take responsibility. We can teach our teens how to apologize. That's very important. But also it's important for them not to feel embarrassed about it. We want them to feel confident and enough to feel that they are capable of apologizing. And then teens who are given both limits and the freedom to make their own decisions tend to be self-driven and self-disciplined. There is a neuropsychologist, William Sticksred, and also a teen coach, Ned Johnson. They wrote a book called The Self-Driven Child, which is a, a fantastic resource, a great book. Um, that, and they both uh, state in the book that parents should hand some decision-making reins over to your teens. And we are gonna talk a little bit more about decision-making in the upcoming slides. All right, thank you, Emily. Now we're gonna look more about that balanced parenting that we keep referring to. The parent role changes, of course, when our kids hit the teenage years. While teenagers are trying to figure out their identity and how to be autonomous, here we are parents, we're trying to figure out our role in, in our teens' lives. Professor of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a longtime member of MSEX Science Advisory Board, Dr. Ken Ginsberg, recommends using what he calls balanced parenting. Balanced parenting is when parents on one side express very high amounts of love and warmth, and on the other hand, they have high values and they monitor them. So research on this balanced parenting shows that kids are more likely to follow the rules that are set. They tend to create stronger parent-child relationships. Our children experience fewer mental health problems like depression or anxiety. And children have better outcomes in schools, meaning they get good grades. Maybe they're less likely to be bullied or be the bully. Um, they're less likely to turn to alcohol or use drugs, some of those risky behaviors. Balanced parenting shows that teens are even most likely to delay their first sexual encounter and most likely to use protection when they do. Teenagers are less likely to be in car accidents and more likely to use a seatbelt. And to learn more about this balanced parenting lifestyle, you can click in your resource Check in your resource, there's a link. And Emily's also put a, a video, a shorter video that you can watch on your own from Dr. Ginsburg talking a little bit more about the power of balanced parenting. It's a little long for us today, but I encourage you to look at it on your own. The balanced, balanced parenting style does help strengthen that parent-teen relationship. Parents must teach our kid, the kids how to make decisions and not to make decisions for them. So when using a balanced parenting style, we teach decision-making and children are not only learning that life skill, but they're strengthening their relationship with their parents. So some of the things that our parents can do to teach those decision-making skills and strengthen that relationship is to involve the teen in the decision-making process. We kind of mentioned this earlier. The decision-making partnership between the parents and teens is an essential strategy for promoting those teens' growing independence and while balancing the parents' needs to protect, which doesn't go away quickly. <laughs> I don't know if it ever does. Being part of the process may promote our teens' confidence in making those future decisions on their own. So our parents' goal is to help their children think for themselves. Thinking for themselves will in turn help them feel like they have some control over their world. So for example, you know, you give teens a say regarding which, hopefully which extracurricular activities, which sports to sign up for when you arrive at a new duty station. I know we moved to Germany and our daughter had swam since she was seven and she was 12, I guess. She said, I don't wanna swim anymore. It killed me because she had so much time invested. Well, we were there maybe five months and she said, I wanna swim. <laughs> so, but it had to be her decision. <laughs> I don't wanna force her to do it. So. Again, we want to practice open listening, listening to what they have to say, and then ask them to think critically about their choices, what will work, 
and what will be problematic about each of the decisions that they're considering and what would be the natural consequence of each choice and how would they feel about dealing with those natural consequences. So we can still mention that we feel uneasy about a decision that they're making just as long as we share our feelings and not our judgment. And it's very difficult to do. The, the, the difference is small, but it's important. We also want to, again, teach by example. We want to model how we make important decisions in our lives. So show, like when you as a parent have, go and seek the advice of someone that you trust. This shows that we can't always do things on our own, and it's not only okay, but it's often good to reach out for the support of others that we, that we trust. And this is especially vital for our military families who often have to rely on others when we transition or we face those challenges or hardships. So show that reaching out for help or support is not a weakness, but a strength and accountability. Again, help teens understand that they may not always make the right decisions, but learning to be accountable for their choices is important. So set up a system of maybe rewards and consequences that correspond with the goals that you and your team have set. So if they choose not to pack up all their sports gear for their practice that they may have to sit on the sidelines and watch instead of participating because they don't have the appropriate attire. Now, don't run home and get it, which is really tempting for us to do. Um, but this allows teens to exercise the power to make their own choices while learning accountability and becoming independent adults. So we want them to learn this when they're younger, right? So that and when they get older and it really matters, they'll have that skill. So let's look at uh, a, a five-step decision-making model that maybe we can share with our kids. This is from Very Well Family, and parents can use this to teach kids how to make healthy decisions. Number one, we want to provide guidance. We want to guide without overdoing it, providing input only when necessary, and letting them experience those nat natural consequences. And make sure, this is important to parents, that you're there for your teen when they fail. They have those natural consequences. They feel awful. You're not going to make them feel any worse by anything you say. You just want to be there with them to help them learn from that experience. You want to help them identify the problem, help them spell out the problem, and teach them to size the problem the right way. Is this a priority right now? Is it something that is really is that important? You want to brainstorm the options, encourage them to identify you know, several options, and then challenge your team to identify as many choices as possible when considering how to what decision to make. And you want to look at each decision possibility and review the pros and the cons. So encourage your team to write down a list of the pros and cons of each option that they've considered. Ask them to identify, well, which one seems best now? And talk about how emotions can actually play a significant role in decision-making. You know, fear can prevent you from doing something and try to help them get that out of the decision-making process. And then finally, you want to create a plan and identify the next steps. Examine whether the choice was effective at the end and whether they can make a better decision maybe in the future. And of course, we do know that our kids will make, will, will fail at some of those decision-making uh, attempts. And Emily's going to talk about how to deal with that. Absolutely. We do know that. So part of moving into adulthood is taking healthy risks. When we as parents create safe boundaries, like the ones that we talked about earlier, parents are creating an environment that will allow their teens to test themselves. When teens fail, and they will, they need to be able to process their mistakes, recover from them, and move on. Dr. Ken Ginsberg does have seven helpful tips for helping your adolescent learn from their mistakes, and I'm going to share those with you now. So the first is to stay calm. This is very important. Parents need to stay calm. If parents can't maintain a sense of control, their teens will sense it and take in their parents' feelings of anger, fear, and panic. Parents also discipline more effectively when calmly teaching children instead of attacking them by shouting things like, what were you thinking? We, we want to try and stay away from that. 
We also, um, oh, excuse me, I'm going to talk about the second point there. We know that our teens can't absorb what's being taught when they are still in that panic mode. For our young people to gain protective insights, they need to be thoughtful. Nobody can be thoughtful or reflective when they're in a state of panic, so we really want to wait until they've calmed down a bit. And we also want to not lecture. Lectures do generally backfire and our teens often don't understand or even hear our lectures, especially if they're already upset. The goal is that children come to their own conclusions and find their own solutions. This enables life experiences to add to their growing toolkit of decision making. So we want to try and refrain from that. We also want to try not to use guilt on our children, even if it feels like they deserve to feel regret. Chances are they already feel bad about what they've done. Instead, tell them your concerns, brainstorm together some potentially better ways to handle similar situations in the future. We also want to try to avoid saying, I told you so. It just doesn't work. Sounding smug will discourage our teens from asking for help the next time they make a mistake. So instead, we want to use the, the approach to error is human. We, we just, we know they're going to make these mistakes. We also want to listen and be their sounding board. Let them know that we trust them and their ability to work through a problem. Let them try to solve issues themselves and find those solutions. Be sure to notice their increasing skills in life's ups and downs, and that will happen. They, they, they will, will increase over time. And let your children know that you love them even when they make those mistakes. Remind them that there's always a chance for forgiveness, a chance to try again, but perhaps with a different approach. Unconditional love does not mean unconditional acceptance. You don't have to accept behaviors that compromise safety or family values, but you should always accept your child. These teenage years are a small window of opportunity for children to slowly practice how to become adults. Fostering a safe environment to do this is an ability that we as parents have. We want to provide opportunities for our teens to practice life skills and to allow them to show you that they can be responsible. And most of all, enjoy this journey with your child. We really hope that you have learned some strategies today that will help your teens gain independency skills. All right, now we hope that you all, that is a really small window but it goes, it seems like when you're in it, it's long, but it goes really quick. But we do want to hear from you. We would like to thank you all for being here at the webinar today. And we like to invite you to take the survey on today's webinar. You can do that by clicking on the survey link in the chat box, or you can use your phone and use the QR code on the slide. You just scan it in, it brings up the link. Once you're in the survey, you want to click on webinar survey and type in the four digit webinar number, which today is 1624. And be sure to hit submit at the end of the survey. Um, just know if you don't fill it out now, you will receive an email invitation to take the survey at a later time. But understand that we use this tool to make ongoing improvements to our webinar series, add new topics of interest, and provide feedback to our funders. So we really do encourage you to take the time necessary to three minutes to complete the survey. So we want to let you know that if you missed one of our previous webinars, or if you would like to share this session, the recordings can be found under our website, militarychild.org, under program trainings and initiatives, click on for parents, and you'll see that there's also a direct link to that YouTube, MSEC YouTube page, where you can find many of the videos we talked about today and a lot more. I also want to invite you to take part in many of our online professional development institute opportunities. You can click on militarychild.org for more information. And of course, please friend us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, all the social media platforms that you see there. 
find out what we're doing, what's going on. And we invite you to check out School Quest. It is an online interactive tool specifically designed to help support our highly mobile military families and students. It has so many resources and tips to help students achieve their academic success and well being. Check it out, it is free. The link is in the chat box and the QR code on the screen. Also, do you have specific questions, maybe concerns or edu on educational related issues for your military connected children? Our military student consultants or MSCs are the premier source to help you with all of your questions. To contact the military student consultants, their email address is in the chat box, contact information is on the screen. And again, that is a free service. So we encourage you to take advantage of that. The Military Child Wellbeing Toolkit was developed for parents, school professionals, mental health professionals, and community leaders. So this tool, again, is full of resources for all aspects of the military child well-being, and we would love for you to explore it and share it. And again, this is a free resource that MSEC offers. Purple Star Readiness Echoes. This training is used as a follow-up to our Purple Star School Support or 360 Summits. So you would find a community of learners in these to help you with your application or your redesignation project process. Um, they are running through May 2024. We meet monthly to address those best practices and common challenges specific to your region. This professional learning community is unlike others you have experienced. So we all sit together and converse to learn more. Click on the QR code provided on your screen or click on that link in the chat box. <laughs> and then we want you to save the date. The MSEC Global Training Summit is already set for next summer, July 29 through 31 in Washington, DC. So if you're interested in that, keep those dates open. If you are interested in re receiving a certificate of completion, please complete that online survey. And if you would like to receive a webinar survey for a recorded webinar that you go back on YouTube to watch, please contact the research at militarychild.org for those surveys. And we also want to uh, let you know we have some great webinars coming up. So Tuesday, We had the one great one today. Wednesday, we have encouraging your military, I'm sorry, your middle and high school reader. And then we have on December 5th, a little break, is what is MSI and impact aid. And that's the military student identifier. <laughs> and we have a subject matter expert to help you with understanding those particular subjects. So we want to thank you for being here today. We want to thank the Navy and Child and Youth Program, our sponsor, for making today's webinar possible. Uh, again, for your participation, and we wish you all a great day. Thank you for joining us.